All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from a sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Casey Devine, who is up in Minneapolis in Minnesota. How are you doing, Casey? Doing quite well. How are you? Good, good, good. And Casey is the Vice President of Strategic Growth at ProCare HR, brings a wealth of experience in sales leadership, business transformation, with a proven track, track record in HR tech and growth strategies, uh, an expert in scaling strategies, value creation. Also, you're the host of your own podcast, uh, focused yeah. on senior living operations in HR, where he shares deep insights and practical advice. And what we're going to talk today is about sales leadership because, uh, uh, as you said, you know you're a you're a sales leader. You have a lot of experience in sales leadership, and still today, the sales leadership position I honestly believe is the most undervalued and underrated position. It is the single biggest uh, accelerator of revenue when you have a good sales leader. That's my belief. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I think it's it's something that's misunderstood as well. Uh, in general, a sales leader, by definition, for me, John, is that it, to use a sports analogy, because we will eventually, they're not somebody who actually touches the ball, they, they coach. And you, you can have all the talented players in the world, but if you're not running the right playbooks, if they're not getting the motivation, the training, the coaching that they need, you're never going to have the team that you need to be successful for your company. Yeah. And a big part of the issue is how we uh, how people end up in sales leadership positions. I mean, oftentimes and uh, and a number of people we talked about this for many years, but a lot of it is you take your you need a new sales leader, you take your top performing rep, you make him a sales leader, you think he'll just get everybody to do what he does and life will be wonderful. And then suddenly within 15 months, he's no longer in the job because it was miserable. You never trained him for it and he or she. And uh, yeah, and they never had any, they never were given the tools to do it correctly. You're dead on. It's, it's I think point number one, is that it is actually a different job. And, and sure enough, you can have player coach jobs and have it be a sales leadership job, fair enough. But it actually is a completely separate profession. And I think that that's something that if you're in your sales career, or even maybe trying to stand up a sales organization as a startup leader, you need to understand that the folks who go you know, hunt down the dragon, so to speak, aren't the same ones who teach you how to do it. And, and mm -hmm. okay, Fair enough. I would say a sales leader at least needs to be in the upper echelon of sales professionals yeah. to be able to close a deal. But that doesn't mean that they're actually the closers, that they find the joy in doing that. And then that's specifically what their skill set is. I can tell you, again, going back to the sports analogy, I could teach you how to pitch a baseball a lot better than I can do it. Right, right. And and one of the things is that, uh, and certainly this was uh, when Neil Rackham did his spin selling, his original research. I mean, one of the big, one of the big discoveries was that you can have a top performer, you can have the, the, the top performing salesperson, and we would call them what they are unconsciously competent, because they can't really tell you what makes them good. It's not, they can't replicate it. They can't teach anybody else how to do it. And therefore that's often what, again, what happens is, you know, we put this person in place and then they just try to sort of do what I did and you say, well, what did you do? And they're not even really sure. <laughs> you're, you're right again. I mean, so, so one thing to note, e even in those scenarios, and, and maybe, maybe you do have a key person that you do want to re replicate, Fair enough. And maybe you do send them to make sure that they are coached up or skilled on sales leadership again. OK, uh, even if you have a team of three, I, I want to speak to the smaller audiences mm -hmm. as well as larger corporations. If all three people are doing the same exact thing in the same exact way, one of the adages that I've shared with folks is that you'll end up running off the same cliff because you're, you're not seeing any sort of diversity of thought or approach. Yeah. And so much of sales is, is not quote unquote, getting to this destination of what works. It's the constant AB testing to figure out what is working. Mm -hmm. And that is a sales leader's job. Yeah. And the other thing you mentioned there was uh, earlier on was coaching and that's another thing, Casey, is like most people are not taught how to coach. It's not even explained what real coaching is. Going back to your sports analogy, most people's last experience of coaching was their 
was their volleyball or football or whatever coach shouting at them from the sidelines, telling them what to do. And they think, okay, that's how you coach, but that's not how you coach professionals. That's not how you coach salespeople. No, it really is. And I was, I was fortunate enough to, you know, quote unquote, grow up in two very large sales organizations that invested in, in talent and in uh, coaching, developing and in sales and leadership development. And that's really where I found that out. It, it really understanding like, Oh, and even just to be able to identify that as an individual uh, producer at the time, that's what so-and-so is trying to do to help me. They're not just being difficult or they're not just asking me questions because they want to hear themselves talk. Like there, there is a method to that. One of the things I would say, if you're even remotely curious, look into situational leadership as mm -hmm. a skill. And I think that's a really great place to start for any leader or aspiring leader. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. Uh, and, and I think that the whole point is, and maybe the other thing that I would say to, to aspiring sales leaders, or even those who are in the position now is, is don't wait around for your company to train you or to do something for you. Because that's, I feel that's often part of the problem is, you know, we sit around and we say, well, they never trained us. I don't know. Instead of you're going, well, hang on, nobody cares about you as much as you do. And if you want to build your skill set and excel, maybe in this company and maybe in other companies after invest in yourself, like do what you just said is like, read some coaching books, take some coaching, go invest in yourself. You're, you're absolutely right. And, and you, I'll, I'll attack an adage that you hear in sales, which is you don't need your MBA to be a salesperson mm -hmm. and, and fair enough. Like there's a lot of folks that, mm -hmm. that are very competent at that. That being said, the role of sales in general, especially sales leadership is business acumen. Yeah. And so, I mean, yes, you can, you can, you can study your craft in your territory or whatever it is, but there's so much more to it. And to your point, I would say, it's really not even that hard to find great like content books. Mm -hmm. I personally recommend because it, it does force you to sit down and consume yeah. something in a defined amount of time intentionally. But nowadays I feel like there's almost a paradigm shift because there's been a democratization of knowledge transfer via what you're doing right now, which is podcasting. I mean, mm -hmm. the fact that you can hop on, listen to 15 minute snippets from a bunch of different people, as opposed to maybe even necessarily taking, I don't know, six hours of your life, sitting down and reading one person's symposium. I mean, that's great. Even if you're just tuning into this podcast, good start, right? Yeah, no, no, fantastic, fantastic start. And you'd like, I, yeah, I mean, I would agree with you completely. Like, there's no excuse, right? I mean, once upon a time, you could say, oh, well, you know, I'm, I, I have to buy the books myself or these courses are really expensive or whatever. I mean, you got so much access to so much information and, and education and a lot of it free is that you have no, you have no excuse. Um, here's another thing, uh, and, and Casey, and tell me that when you first moved into sales management, how big a temptation was it for you to be a super closer? So to be focused on the end of the, the, the latter stages of the pipeline and, and thinking that you're helping by jumping in and like pushing things over the line. I mean, how big a temptation was that when you first started? I mean, it was huge. The two extremes are refreshing your CRM and waiting for your salespeople to do something. Mm -hmm. And then the next temptation is I'm just going to go do it. Neither are the answer. I mean, they, they really aren't. That being said, like, it, it's a fine line. Like, I, 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 I hear that a lot. And I also want to issue a word of caution, which is yep. that, you know, sales leadership is an active role or should be when well practiced. So, you know, you shouldn't jump in because you're, you're a robbing the, the uh, hit that you get from learning something and B, mm -hmm. Even, you know, you got to be able to save a big deal when when you need to, sure, but you sure. also need to make sure and understand that in the big scope of things, let's call it 10, 50, 100 versus this one. Like, let's make sure that that you're, you're there. All of that comes back to, obviously, you have to have proper top of funnel. If, if you mm -hmm. are a brand new sales leader and we've been there too, where maybe you take over a very poor performing team, you need to come in and show that you, A, you know what to do and B, that you can hit the number. And, and if you push the gas pedal, the car moves. But mm -hmm. once you've gotten past that desperation stage, like you got to stop and you got to make sure that your team isn't accidentally learning helplessness from you. Right. 
because you were Superman or Superwoman. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and doing that where, you know, if I wait long enough, they'll jump in and do it for me. <laughs> it's like a baby bird in the nest and you just see yeah. the beaks. It's like, no, we're, we're all trying to learn to fly. Yeah, yeah, and and I think uh, part of the other part is uh, is getting that, as you said, top of funnel focus. That's where you can really, as a sales as a sales leaders, you can really make sure and help that things are qualified properly and that you're getting the right uh, you're getting the right opportunities into the pipeline. So you're not ending up with a bloated pipeline. And I, and I think that's a, that's such a valuable uh, use of of a sales leader's time. Absolutely. To, to give everybody who's listening, maybe a, just a small action item or something to remember, you can walk away with uh, a, a little bit of uh, an adage, teach, show, let. And mm -hmm. so that's going to be philosophically whiteboard or maybe curbside coaching. I'm going to teach you this skill that I'd like you to go do. And, and even then, I'm going to then show you in action, in the field, on the phone, whatever it is, how that should look when it's executed well. And, and there are recording um, technologies, sales sure. loft, gong, that you can do this at, at scale now. And then last, like truly, like I, I mean it by the, the you, you do it, you show them, you know, on a whiteboard, you show them in real life and then go. Yeah. <laughs> that, like that's how you can get into that. And the second thing to note with that is that that's actually per skill. So closing isn't a skill even, it's a set of skills. There's yeah. certain things you need to understand on how to do that. And so make sure, again, going back to situational leadership that you, you break out what's actually it's gonna take from pipeline generation all the way to getting a deal done and forecasting correctly, figure out what those skills are, figure out where your, your knowledge level and, and motivation are on that, and then teach, show, let to build that mm -hmm. uh, curve up. And then let's talk a little bit about sales process, because I think that's another area where, uh, you know, a really good sales leader is going to be looking at the sales process and is going to be constantly evaluating it and and tweaking it. Because here's something I you probably come across this too, Casey, is sometimes people think, oh, well, we've got a sales process. Yeah, we did it like two years ago. It's fine. It, it seems to work. And you're going, wow. That's amazing. So in the last two years, your buyers haven't changed at all. Your business hasn't changed a little bit. Things, nothing, everything is exactly the same as it was two years ago, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's it's common to see. It, here's the the way I, I like to describe a sales process is it, it's home base. Um, it, and I actually had a sales leader I, I really respect explain it this way. And I don't have a whiteboard, so I'll do my mm -hmm. best with, with a hand. And if a sales process is like a, it's a straight line from point A to point B. It, in reality, there is never a straight line from point A sure. to point B in any sales process ever. And if they are, you're being secret shopped. So mm -hmm. it's, it's from yeah. point A to point B is the sales process. And you can kind of go over here and maybe over here, but if you don't know that line of what, you know, the classroom definition of your process is, you have nothing to come back to. And the problem with it at scale is that you start drifting off in, into no man's land, so to speak, and you don't have something to come back to. So exactly what you said, like if we're saying from point A to point B, nothing's ever going to be perfect that way. But you do have to, to follow something to, your, to mm -hmm. your point. Make sure that you're updating it and that your assumptions that led you to that process two years ago and your example mm -hmm. actually are relevant to what's closing business today. I mean, you don't think that it's possible for buyers to change that fast? Oh, yeah. Did we forget what happened in COVID like yeah. yet? Like that that was faster than two years. And if you were executing on a playbook that was just produced, like you almost had to throw it out the door overnight. Those little micro trends, though, maybe not to the you know scale of a pandemic, are happening all the time, and we have to be professional enough to recognize that. Well, well, I mean, with AI now, I mean things are happening even more dramatically. So, I mean, there's there's something where who knows who knows in two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, there'll be something change. I've never, I mean, not getting off topic, but this is the first time in my career, certainly, that I have seen where you would adopt a tool, and then two weeks later, you'll ah this is a better one you'll adopt another one and that's kind of ai and that's why it's a kind of wild west right now but it's it's happening really quickly but on the on that point of not so much ai but on on you know your tech stack etc you know sometimes uh 
I find that people can get lost in their tech stack, right? Because they haven't optimized it. They haven't figured out what, what parts of, you know, which parts integrate fit together and what are they using each individual part for? How important it is, is it to really get your tech stack right? I personally think it's crucial and I'll get opinionated. First of all, I'm glad you haven't noticed I'm an AI agent yet. But no. outside of that, um, <laughs> so am it's, I, so. it's important. Like <laughs> when we were talking about um, an organization I, I joined, for example, I came on board, they had a world-class tech stack and I'm not kidding. Like mm -hmm. very, very good. What you said on, on the last question happened and it is that it was built for the sales process two years ago. And now what, with what reality was there, not only was it not supporting today's sales process and what happened in reality, it was actually making it harder. Right. And so like understand that, and this, this sound bite might throw people off, but sales tech isn't actually necessary to complete a sale. Like we, we need to remember that those are mm -hmm. all bells and whistles and that there was a time where you just had like quarters in a phone booth and, you know, a map. It's possible. So like, let's go there. That being said, though, is like in, in the age of AI and in the age of all of this technology, it's irresponsible because mm -hmm. why in the world would you ask someone to invest their career in your opportunity if you're not willing to make sure that they can be as successful as possible? And then yeah. even I'll speak cold hearted capitalist here. Like, why would you pay for someone to generate revenue and then not make small investments that are going to make sure that most of their time is spent generating revenue? Yeah. So that's where I will say, even just a small sales tech stack that's intentionally built, great. Mm -hmm. And if you want to go find some good sales tech, just post on LinkedIn and some very good salespeople will help you. There's some great sales tech startups out there that are really hungry to get a shot. And mm -hmm. I've I've personally benefited from giving some of those people shots because you can get early mover act, um, advantage on some of this stuff before anybody else would. Yeah, no, no, I'm, absolutely. I, I agree with you. And uh, you should check out Pipeline and CRM as part of that tech stack. So um, shameless plug. <laughs> anyway, uh, the other thing that I wanted to talk to you just in, in closing is, and I, and I think this is one of the most critical pieces is, is to reorient your thinking around strengths and weaknesses, right? Because we are hardwired as as humans. We love that's. I always use the example of performance reviews, right? You know, your annual performance reviews. I hate those stupid things, but it was always like, oh, you know, John, here's two things you're doing really well, and now here's fifty two things that you're not that you really need to work on, and you're just going and you look at them and think, you're going, yeah, but I'm. I'm never going to be any good at any of these things. Why are you wasting your time? And I think that's it in sales that we're, sometimes we're very reluctant to kind of segment people uh, and focus on their strengths. I mean, sometimes you have people who are phenomenal door openers. Yeah. And once the door is open, they're not very good at the process, right? Or yeah. they're not very good at the, the other part, or they're not very good at the closing part. But you have somebody else who's who's not very good at door opening or whatever, but is a fantastic person moving somebody through through the pipeline. So really focusing on, on strengths. And I think that's not done enough by sales leaders is looking at their salespeople and saying, OK, rather than trying to make Casey good at everything or average to good at everything, I'm going to really focus on the things he's excellent at. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, first things first, how do you identify strengths? Go see them. And then you do need data from yeah. a CRM like Pipeliner to be able to prove that your assumptions are correct, not that you, you saw that person do it once and that now they're your closer. Like the, rely on some sort of data before you make decisions that impact your business or people. And then from there, like I, I like to ask funny rhetorical questions like Henry Ford and the onset of the um, assembly line, did, like the why that was successful was because everybody had specialization. Mm. And it's something that we've built our entire economy on is specialization so much so that I don't know how to fix my furnace. And 50 years ago, that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So why does that stop when we get to the door of sales where yep. we would just expect that all of a sudden these people are always <laughs> going to know everything. And I get that there are budgetary restraints and sometimes sure. you do just need a generalist. Great. Okay. But once you get semi mature in your business, 
110%. Strengths, by definition, are going to be something that you are skilled at that you enjoy. Yes. It's not just that you're skilled at it because yep. then it's just a skill. So mm -hmm. when you find that, you're going to find people that are in a flow state. I've met people that have been in sales for 25 years. And the only thing they do is business development. Yep. And they love it. Mm -hmm. And I've met people that have been in sales for 25 years that haven't picked up the phone in 15. Yeah. So like, make sure that you're putting the right puzzle pieces in the right place. And don't think that, oh, we got to sales. So we're just going to throw everything we know about business out the window now. Yeah, yeah. No, and I think that's an excellent, I think it's a fantastic point to close on, Casey, because you're so right. It's like if for some reason we throw out all the rules when it comes to sales and, and we think, uh, yeah, it, it it's kind of, it's frustrating and it's kind of, on. it's hard to understand why, but anyway. So all of Casey's information is going to be below this video, but before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Yeah, so I'm vice president of strategic growth with an HR managed services firm that really specializes in senior living. I come from a background in HR tech and outsourcing um, and, and sales leadership as as it goes there. So one of the things I would just say is um, I, I've accelerated my career rel relatively quickly and it's become from putting people first and owning my own development. Mm -hmm. If I had to give any words of advice Put people first, not yourself, but people first. Find ways to help other people, and that's your responsibility mm -hmm. as a sales professional. And then relentlessly own pro professional development. And when I say that, John, I mean it. Like, even if it's not a skill you think you need today, again, you never know when a pandemic comes because my <laughs> career started in outside sales, and then, oh, now I'm an inside sales leader. And yep. had I not been doing some of that research, I would have absolutely tanked my career. So yeah. do both. I highly encourage you. <laughs> Absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you. Great words of advice. So thanks again, Casey. Thank you for watching, listening.